Welcome to the Life Science, Life Science Success Podcast. It's early in the morning and uh, my tongue's not quite working uh, right this morning. But uh, so welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don. I'm a consultant in life science and uh, I am very excited to welcome our guest today. But before we hop into the interview, I wanted to quickly mention D3 Digital Media. D3 employs decades of life science experience and innovative technology to develop and define digital marketing strategies for healthcare companies so that they can build their digital voice, increase awareness, and drive leads, positioning themselves effectively in the competitive marketplace. The uh, key things that we work on are things like websites and SEO, social media, live events and webinars, just like the the event that you're watching now. And so um, for companies that are looking to have a webinar that's not structured like a standard slide presentation that's boring with uh, with people, you know, presenting and no engagement, uh, those are not the things that we typically do. We typically do things that are very engaging, like the thing that we're about to do here with John. So John Alderet uh, it has successfully applied his wide range of experience and formal training to the evolution, fi evolution financing formation and operation of diagnostics and medical device technology companies. So with that, welcome, John. Thank you. Good morning, Don. Yeah, I'm very excited to get to talk about Folium and uh, the things that you're working on uh, as well. And so would you just take a moment and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I, I'm a kind of a renaissance guy. I, I'm a scientist by training. I'm a virologist from University of Washington, uh, but opted not to become a scientist in, in that sense. Uh, so I went the consulting route and did consulting for multinational companies on the product level, but uh, then started the long, arduous path of being a serial entrepreneur, starting companies in the diagnostic space. And I've taken some detours along the way, worked for Stanford School of Medicine. I've had my own brewery along the way as well. Uh, but ultimately keep finding myself back into the startup space. Yeah, and you're uh, you're even earlier than I am. So my, my thing about my tongue not working properly because it's so early isn't really a good excuse because it's not, you know, what, 2 a.m. or something like it's, it is for you. It's 2 a.m. here for sure. And, and you actually have me at a bit of a disadvantage. I haven't even had coffee yet. It was a little <laughs> bit too early for coffee. You, you have me at my rawest. That, uh, well, I guess uh, I guess that will be uh, the make for an interesting interview at the very least. And so, um, so yeah, so I mean, I guess the, maybe let's peel back a little bit, you know, some of this thought in terms of w what made you, I mean, as you graduated, what made you sort of want to focus on the consulting side and not, not want to be in on the bench? Well, I, I, you know, my father was a scientist and I basically um, like to say I grew up in a lab, which isn't too far from the truth. And uh, so I've been around academic uh, research as long as I can remember. And when I was a graduate student myself, I had a chance to participate in other groups. Uh, at the time, they were named the Washington Biomedical and Biotechnology Association. So I'd, I'd go to meetings and see how industry side worked um, and very quickly became aware that there was a big disconnect between how the business people in medtech and biopharma were talking versus how the scientists were talking. They were, weren't really speaking the same language. And so I was very interested in that, uh, that chasm and wanted to be a part of the solution of, of being able to be that person in the middle. So being business and science. And that was ultimately uh, my goal. So that's what prompted me to go off and, and uh, not continue to do bench work, although ultimately we ended up doing that with our companies. Uh, but I went through the consulting route uh, to see how the, the big boys essentially did product development. And then, um, and then, I mean, it seems that uh, it's also led you to entrepreneurship as well. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a sickness, I guess, once you start a company and you develop a, a very keen skill on, on how that process works. Um, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to leave. There's so much creativity there and uh, you get to meet some incredible people along the way. So being a naturally creative person, I guess I gravitate towards being an entrepreneur more than, uh, working behind a desk for a larger company. I, I did my stint at Stanford and I, I was nearly crawling out of my skin. So I, I couldn't wait to, to get back on the, the horse again. That's interesting to, uh, to, to think about as well. I mean, uh, there's, there's just, I think. I mean, obviously, there are different 
types of people and different types of approaches that I think that we all, we all wind up taking. Um, and I feel like there is a, a definite need for individuals that set at that sort of intersection of, you know, okay, so I'm not, I personally am not a research scientist. I'm a consultant who sits in the middle of, you know, business and science at, as well. And, um, What's interesting and somewhat frustrating to me sometimes is people that continually treat their company as if it is a research project. And I mean, I get that research is important. It's absolutely critical, but there has to be a point in time. And I I had a conversation earlier this week with somebody who essentially had an approved FDA device. So it's, it's ready to go. They hadn't thought about commercialization and they hadn't finalized manufacturing. And I was like, I mean, essentially, and, and what, where they're back at now because of the fact that they don't have a way, they don't, there isn't a clear path to cash. Yeah. They're back looking for investors. And I said, good luck. I mean, I don't think there's, that's a tough position. I don't think there's many, I don't think there's many investors that would look at you and, and invest a dollar um, because you have a device that you could sell. Why aren't you selling it? And everybody's going to be asking you that very question. So I said, I would be very prepared for that question. (laughs) And uh, I don't know that there's many people at this point, uh, you know, other than somebody that's willing to sort of, you know, roll up their sleeves and help you, you know, get your device out the door, which I would do, but, you know, leadership Mm -hmm. has to be behind it, right? So, Mm -hmm. and at this point, they're still saying that they want to go do research. And I was like... Yeah, no. you know, there's there's so many trappings and in, in everything that you just said. Uh, obviously, the cynical part of me as an entrepreneur have seen, I have participated in all of these discussions, and I've heard the no's from every different angle from investors. And you become quickly aware that there are knowledge gaps everywhere, and you can't really satisfy everybody all the time. I, I don't know anything about the product. It could be the bee's knees. Uh, but as you mentioned, if they don't have a path to commercialization or, you know, other elements that are critical to developing their value in the eyes of investors, it's going to be a long road. So we, in terms of thinking about research, I think this is a bit of a, I mean, this sort of bifurcated issue here. One is we've, I've seen over the course of my career, lots of scientists uh, who come out of academia who have a research project that they think is a company. And that's, that's not really how it works. Nobody really wants to pay for research. And so my approach, having seen how academics, academia works, is I like to focus on things that come out of research institutes and universities, but have bodies of knowledge behind it. So it's not really research anymore. It's more applied application of that, of that science. And, uh, but even if you get to that point, the discussion with potential funders is difficult because they see it purely as research, even though it's a development issue project, not research. So there are lots of factors that go into this. And it's, it's, um, there's always, it's like raising a child, there's always some other issue that pops up. Once you think you've figured something out, it's, it's really challenging. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, I, it's where I look at the entrepreneurs, and I go, you know, you, you, whenever you're the CEO of a life science company, especially a new startup, you have, you, you have a portion of time whenever you're definitely heads down and you're looking Mm -hmm. at a lot of tactical stuff for a good amount of time. And then once you get through that tactical stuff, you better have your eyes on the horizon and what's coming at you next because there is an unpleasant surprise, I'm sure, waiting for most entrepreneurs right around the corner. And um, yeah, I mean, you have to kind of understand a little bit about the path um, that you're going to walk um, because if you only... If you mm-hmm. only know what you know from research or you only know what you know from business, neither one is going to help you. You have to have this collaborative sort of fit where you just go, you know, okay, there's a, a level of expertise that I need, you know, on both sides. And right. uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So tell me more about Folium Biomed. Uh, you know, what, what are you working on? And uh, yeah, what's what's underway? Well, uh, Folium Biomed... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back and, and throw out a bit of a, a broad uh, topic. We don't have to talk about it, but it really is the foundation for Folium Biomed. And as an entrepreneur, anybody who's gone through the selling of equity for a company realizes that what we're really talking about and, and where a lot of issues arise for startups 
um, frankly, at any stage of their life, even when they're more mature, is a question of control, right? Because once you sell a part of your company, somebody else has control. And sometimes, and I might say often, those elements are not aligned. The people invest in you and what you're trying to do are not necessarily aligned because they have a, a pure financial interest in, you know, the, the founders may have uh, other interests um, aside from, from being purely monetary. And I have, um, and I know others have experienced this, uh, you know, when we are CEOs of, of startups, we try to provide our stakeholders uh, optionality. So we don't like being one trick. I don't like being one trick pony uh, company. Uh, I like building value. And, and the problem with that is if you build value into a company with multiple different potential revenue options and something goes wrong with that company, all of that optionality is locked in that, in that company, right? So you lose a lot of potential value there. And uh, I've experienced this myself. It's quite frustrating. And uh, Foley and Biomed was basically born as a holding company. And, you know, I have a team, quite proficient and fantastic group of, of scientists and regulatory experts. But uh, we basically will take a technology and put it into Foley and Biomed and uh, we spin it out as an individual company. And that way, if that company goes down in flames, it doesn't take out the other efforts that we're that we're working on. Um, and so that's that's really what Folium is. It's, it's a holding company. It's a model that ha I've seen in Silicon Valley a couple of different times in different iterations. We're just not as not as sexy uh, in that sense. <laughs> yeah, in terms of, um, you know, I guess in terms of, the, let's kind of peel back a little bit more on the, the assets, right? So one of the things yeah. I heard you say was that, I mean, if you have a bunch of, let's say a, a, a series of assets and, and they're all together, uh, if one fails, they you know they're all somewhat tied together. How is your model different? Well, um, I can give you hypotheticals uh, in this case, but let's just say, for example, we had a diagnostic test for you know, uh, well, let's make it relevant for today for for um, the, the SARS-CoV-2, right? And our diagnostic test uh, had an application in multiple different um, sampling types. Mm -hmm. We had some diversity with sampling types and those sampling types had applications in other business areas for other, you know, viruses, let's just say, but something happened to that company. And maybe we had intellectual property surrounding, you know, multiple different components of our testing pathway. And if that company had any sort of issue, it, uh, couldn't seek funding, whatever, whatever the issues may be, there are many of them, all of that intellectual property would go away, multiple, multiple elements of it. What we choose to do is we choose to take a singular piece of intellectual property mm -hmm. uh, and then form a company around that. And if we have other elements that add value to that, we'll, we'll form companies around that and license into the main effort. That way, if there's an issue with the main uh, company, we don't lose the other assets that themselves have their own value. So it's really just a question of protecting ourselves from well, essentially, you know, the other varied interests that are buying into the company, which is, is can, like I said, can be at odds. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of think about, I mean, I, I, you know, you, you look at a um, larger, whether it's pharma company or diagnostics company, right? I mean, they will have a, a portfolio of things, one that mm -hmm. are out in the public and two that they're working on in, behind the scenes. And, and similarly, right. I mean, they're not locked one way or the other. Right. And I tried, I personally tried taking a similar sort of approach with a, a few other assets as well. Uh, you know, right. I tried, I tried this approach, I think like a year and a half ago. And I remember, you know, speaking to like um, some individuals that were investors that, you know, just essentially, you know, um, had, had, uh, you know, invested in similar types of assets that I was interested in and in sort of bringing forward. And they, they had said, um, you know, there's a lot of risk that sort of comes with this approach. Cause I, I, you know, essentially I had said, you know, look, why not pick like a menu of things that all work sure. on the same disease type or the same, you know, sort of thing. And, and similarly, they were sort of cautioning doing that because they, they were like, you know, one, it, it, it you know, raises the amount of capital that you have to have. <laughs> and then, then two, um, you know, the challenge becomes what happens if one asset fails where the other, you know, other ones don't. So Yeah, fair, fair enough. I, I guess the, for me, the story uh, and the lesson at the end of the day is you, you really can't 
satisfy everybody, right? So regardless of the approach, there's always going to be an issue with it. And so you really have to find the approach that works best for you and your team. And uh, this has worked for us pretty well. Uh, it allows us to be pretty nimble. Um, and, and I think it's important for me to articulate that any of the companies that we build aren't intended to be brick and mortar companies. And for us, that's really important because our goal is to satisfy the pipeline of larger strategic partners. You know, I, this is what I did as a consultant, understood what their pipeline needs were. And uh, so we build companies essentially to be an asset to larger partners. So we don't have time to uh, really worry about getting immersed into complexities of what you know, stakeholders may or may not want or how we're going to grow. It's pretty, for us, it's pretty simple. We, we have a goal, we have a target, we have an end game, and we try to make that as linear as possible. Mm, very interesting. And so um, it, are you at a point now where you um, are accepting other technologies or, or yeah? yeah. I'd like to I'd like to say that uh, Folium would be successful if my team was you know five times as large. Uh, the the truth of the matter is that we're so um, involved in one particular technology. We essentially just do serial companies, you know, one after the other. We don't have multiple projects. Now we have technology sort of waiting in the wings that we know we're going to at- approach uh, once this current project is over. Um, but we don't have multiple projects going on at the same time. We just don't don't have the bandwidth to be honest with you. Uh, I'd love to do that, but it's just not possible. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I completely understand. And so, um, you know, I guess explain to me a little bit more of, you know, if I'm a company out there and I happen to be listening to the podcast mm. um, and I'm looking for either in investment and I, you know, might think that I fit into your portfolio. Um, is this something that you're interested in having further conversations with companies? Sure, no problem. And then, and as an aside, uh, so Folium doesn't really do work for hire. Uh, we've been approached to do that. And we're quite capable of doing that. But like I said, we're so focused on the projects that, well, frankly, I'm I'm interested in. It's the benefit of being the boss. Um, but but I do have plenty of conversations with other companies and and sort of helping them with their development pathway or their regulatory needs. Kind of kind of acting like a consultant. Um, but we have in the past as a team assisted with other companies and their efforts. We have some incredible scientists behind the scenes. I'm absolutely not one of them, but, but we do have them. Uh, so, so I'm always happy to talk to other companies. And, and quite frankly, you never know where there are potential synergies uh, these days. And I find that those synergies between companies can be a very powerful tool and very attractive to larger um larger entities that are looking for more robust technologies. So I would highly encourage them if they want to, to try to reach out to me, that's, that's totally fine. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, I, given kind of the environment, right. I, I do feel a bit like, um, I mean, there's a lot, an awful lot, you know, and you said it just a minute ago, that there's lots of reasons why, com- why companies object, but I, I feel like there's an awful lot of, um, presenting that happens. Uh, especially right now, even when, and, and, and I don't know, part of the, the cynical side of me says, you know, if, if from the very beginning, if your answer was going to be no, because of a variety of reasons, um, and number one being that you just don't have the money to invest, then, um, my thought is, you know, as, as, um, critical as investors are, I'm, I have the same criticism, I guess, back, which is, you know, uh, make the decision quick and don't waste the entrepreneur's time, right? I mean, nobody, nobody has the time to just keep presenting one time after the other, only to get to the end to say, you know, the fir- very first presentation, you, know, you told us mm-hmm. something that told us that we weren't going to invest and we've more or less validated that assumption now. And it's like, well, in the first presentation, why didn't you tell us that you had, you essentially had made that determination? We could have saved ourselves yeah. two more two more rounds of this pain where we're trying to sort of clarify a point that uh, that you've already deemed wasn't a good wasn't a good pathway forward. You know, you've you've touched on something that's so incredibly important, and uh, it was it's becoming. I think it's becoming easier now thanks to the internet and the information that's available. I mean, prior to all of the information that's readily at our fingertips, we didn't have any clue how VC worked or angel groups worked, or it, it, it was a 
complete black box, right? And it really was who you knew, not really what you knew. And to some extent that still exists to this day, but there's so much information that exists for entrepreneurs and, and investors for that matter. We still have a huge gulf between the, the conversation between the two entities. And, uh, you know, investors aren't, like you just said, telling the entrepreneurs, this is what we're really specifically interested in. And the entrepreneurs aren't really presenting it in the best way. And this has actually been a lifelong quest for me. I, you know, scientists in particular, you know this uh, as well as being a PhD, we like to bring people to a point of agreement based on information and facts. So we like to overshare. Um, right. and completely irrelevant to people who are you're pitching for investment. They don't literally don't care. Now, maybe they'll get to it because they typically have some science expertise behind the scenes, but in the initial phase, none of that matters. And that really takes some getting used to, and that's a skill, especially for, for scientists, um, and science oriented people to, to acquire. So it's a, it's an ongoing balance. I do think. However, just to go on a bit of a tangent, I do think that VCs in, in particular in the life science sector aren't really asking the questions they think they're asking. And, and as, a, as a very simplistic example, there's been a, an interest in, in uh, moving towards earlier stage investments in the life sciences. And this, you can see this at the recent JPM Morning Chase meeting in San Francisco. This past January, a lot of interest in moving towards earlier stage investments, but there's still later stage, earlier stage investments. And when they say, right. oh, well, we want, we're interested in seed investing and you go to them with, or pre-seed investing. Well, we go to them with a pre-seed investment opportunity. You know, it's not, it's not mature enough. Right. So, so there is a bit of a disconnect with the language that's used and the expectations. That's an ongoing issue, but I think we have tools now that are finally allowing us to understand each other from a different level. Yeah, and I think I mean this. This um, I mean, I, you know, that certainly everybody knows kind of what happened with with Theranos as well, right? Where the where the technology is way oversold in terms of what it could actually deliver, and and um, you know, essentially, you know, the the investors were were completely sold uh, a bag of goods. But the I mean, on the other side, if you have people who are good researchers that are essentially bringing data, right? And saying this is, you know, it, 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 at a very early stage, it is a very risky proposition still. And um, that's the, kind of the last thing most investors want to hear. Um, you know, they want to hear, oh, there's a clear pathway. And, and that clarity yeah. doesn't oftentimes happen in our space until, you know, kind of the middle of the project or even the end. <laughs> you know, I think, I think this is a big issue that you just touched upon because in the life sciences, we're talking about biology. We're not, we're not talking about widgets or, you know, computer components. It's just not the same. And uh, we, we personally choose to focus on diagnostics in the infectious disease space. And we use some very well uh, tested technologies, but at the end of the day, we still rely on cells, you know, biological materials that can fail. You know, there's no guarantee. So our uh, potential for risk is much higher. And if that's not something that you're comfortable with as an investor, you really don't need to be in this space because what ends up happening, and this is my personal pet peeve, and this is because it's 2.30 in the morning, uh, I'm, I'm unfiltered saying this. If we take a look at a lot of investments in the healthcare, quote unquote, healthcare sector, a lot of it is technology oriented, not really innovative in the true life sciences area. It's, you know, better uh, patient record manipulation or aggregation, you know, better ability to, you know, uh, capture bills that aren't paid or whatever, whatever it is, it's not really life science investing. It's sort mm. of systems investing. And that's a big problem. So originally when we, you and I talked uh, about this opportunity to speak with you, I said we were working on a, a funding approach. And, and that's still ongoing. It's, this is going to take some time. But one of the things that we, as a group of us behind the scenes, realize is that we are missing out on a lot of truly innovative uh, human health changing technologies, and they're just being looked over. And part of this is we have this funding gap, the valley of death that I'm, I'm sure you've talked about before, perhaps on the show. 
between the sort of basic science and the applied science uh, arenas. Yep. And I stumble with my words because it's so incredibly uh, awkward to see and hear about stories and see with my own eyes, venture capitalists walking the halls of Stanford looking for the next greatest thing, but you never see them again because they simply don't understand what it is they're looking at or even looking for. They don't, they don't know what questions to ask. And recently for me, I was in Southern California uh, last year, or late last year, talking with a, uh, a life science venture group. And I knew I was in trouble when I had to explain what antibodies were. Now, <laughs> fundamental, fundamental biology here. And if, if we can't even move past that, there's no hope of understanding, you know, how we're going to take our expertise and apply it to a relatively simple problem. It's, it's, a it's a bit of a mix right now. Yeah. You, t yeah, you touch a bit sure. of a nerve here, Don. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a nerve for all of us, especially yeah. right now. Um, you know, I know with one one of the companies that that I'm working with, I mean, I think we've had over 25 pitch sessions. Uh, we've narrowed it down to like three or four potential finalist investors who are, you know, going through our data room and things like that. But it's a... Um, it's an interesting process so to sort of of watch and the in the there are just parts of me that just are, are like you know I, I understand I certainly understand the idea that scientists need to learn how to tell a story and we've we've sort of um, taken the approach of uh, rather than having a traditional founders video we have a, a video that sort of tells the story of the company and, and why this is a problem inside of the industry in a very short, you know, sort of two to three minute, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, video that explains very clearly, this is, this is what the technology is. And then moving on, this company mm -hmm. has some tremendous capability. And I, I feel, I feel really for the, the initial founders of the company, because they've been doing this for over a decade, you know, they've been sort of, you know, working on this idea for over a decade. And uh, here I am coming at the, at the end stage of trying to bring it, you know, through funding. And I'm just sitting here going, I, I mean, mm. there's some companies that clearly don't understand and, and why not just tell us at the very beginning, you don't understand and we'll, you know, find, find a way to break it down so that you do. And if you yeah. still don't think it's a spot for you to invest, please make the determination early because time is precious. <laughs> so. Yeah. There, there are many tragic stories like that for sure. And it's, yeah. it's absolutely heart wrenching to watch because a lot of these technologies are truly cool and, and would be helpful, you know, to patient health or human health. Right. Yeah. It's, it's hard to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So, John, what's some of the best leadership advice that you've ever received? Uh, I haven't had that many mentors. Uh, a lot of my my learning has come through experience and, you know, getting knocked down a lot. Uh, so one of the best things that I could possibly, at least when I start out, um, and I'm a bit lucky this way because we've sorted this out already, is you have to have you have to have the right team. And I think there's a misconception about how teams work, uh, that there has to be harmony, right? Or there has to be an authoritative leader or whatever, whatever the, the tropes are. Uh, the truth of the matter is good teams are very dynamic and there's conflict in teams. It's how you resolve that conflict that's important. And you get a lot of your great ideas uh, with born out from that, those discussions. So having that team uh, is, is phenomenal. Not bringing on people just because they have historical significance, your buddy, your lab mate, whatever, that invariably causes issues. The one thing uh, that I've learned over the years is that I don't care who you think your teammates are, the prospect of money does weird things to people. Typically, people start spending, pre-spending in their mind. It doesn't even exist yet, but hope hope is a powerful thing it can also be a very destructive thing uh so i think being prepared for understanding that people's self-interests tend to come out more than the team's interests when they think there's a, an advantage to be gained and that can come from your own team that can come from board members that can come from all sorts of different sources uh, when they think that there's something in it for them that they can get at the expense of others i've seen that uh, plenty of times 
The other element I think that's important is, uh, and this was a lesson in the discussion that I heard recently, didn't necessarily apply to us so much, but uh, if you're a company making just another X, Y, and Z product that's marginally better than something on the product on the market currently, completely uninteresting. Uh, and it very may well be that that's your technology, that's fine, but how to think about that in the context of creating a new channel, something, something that's actually innovative, not just marginally better. That is a challenge and it's not applicable to everybody, but uh, I think the data show that if you're just a, uh, a company that makes something that's just slightly better, um, you're, you're not going to be on the market that long, even if you are successful being you know, commercializable. Uh, so I think those are some of the big ones that we think about uh, going forward, and we try to approach, approach those elements um, as we start each each company. Yeah, absolutely. We did get a question. Um, I, oftentimes, I don't I don't bring these up, uh, you know, but uh, you know, I'll just uh, sort of pop it up here on the screen as well. Um, so the the question is: we we know investors don't understand too much on research. How can technology experts get access to the IP in a collaborative way with scientists and productize the research? Uh, the technology experts are coming from the investors. Well, I think, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think uh, again, to sort of heart back on this, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but the technology almost doesn't matter when you're having those initial discussions. It is literally the investors are coming in and they're looking at it from an investment and return standpoint. That's it. So you need to be able to address the question, the, the typical things, what's the problem? How are you going to solve it? You know? Um, and, uh, the fallacies in those kind of discussions are uh, not knowing what your exit is, not not truly accurately representing what the forecasting may look like. Um, but if those investors are worth their salt, they will have technologists behind them, people like me, for example, that they can go to and say, what do you think about this? Right. right? And that's really where the power happens. So you have to get past that initial discussion first before you can even begin to start thinking about presenting that technology to them. You know, you can answer the question, do you guys have patents? Yes. Or we're filing provisionals. Wherever. Those are easy answers. They don't need to see the patents. They don't need to read them. They don't want to read them. <laughs> so don't present them. Um, keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah. That, that idea of, of making the present, fitting the presentation for the audience is absolutely critical and kind of understanding that initial, the initial audience is normally, a series of individuals who are screening lots of different ideas, right? So their, that's, that's the, the, yeah. their, their position is to screen. And then the second round is the deeper uh, level of technologists, right? So they're normally, like you said, there are people like you who would come in from the behind, from behind the scenes and essentially look at the initial pitch deck that was presented and say, yes, I agree. Either this is a good idea or no, here are 10 pitfalls that we need to clarify with them. You know, are, right. are, are if these things been thought about and are they sort of considering the broader market? And then what I've seen anyway is sort of that third level of presentation is like, um, have you thought about this beyond it just being in the lab? And are you thinking about like, what's going to happen whenever you go to commercialize? What do you, what's going to happen whenever you have to, you know, manufacture this thing, if it's something that's going to be, you know, uh, you know, have to have to have additional structure applied to it, I would say. Um, that's at least what I've seen. Um, you know, I, I, I would imagine there are other uh, approaches, but yeah, I agree with you in terms of, you know, making it fit the, the individual that, <laughs> that's in front of you as well. It's okay uh, as a founder, and this is, uh, I've had discussions with some founders and I, I sit on a board of, of such a company and I've had some, some opportunities to talk to the founder about this at length, is understanding what the expectation of that founder is, right? So if you as a founder um, expect to take your company to IPO, it's not going to happen. Your, your expertise is not that. Your expertise is developing a product to a point and it's okay to say that, to say, when we get to the point of commercialization, we are going to bring in the expertise that we need to make this successful. It's a, it's a complicated discussion, but a lot of founders feel this is their baby, right? This is very personal to them. Right. And uh, that's hard, but, but I want to contrast that with what happens with entities like Theranos, 
Now, uh, Ms. Holmes was able to you know, stay at the helm of that company uh, as a founder, and we lauded, we, not I, but it, she was lauded uh, for that effort. But at the end of the day, she didn't actually have a product. Right, that company, I should say, didn't didn't have a product. Right. So, so there was a failure in asking uh, from the investment side to actually look at that IP. They didn't have people like me behind the scenes uh, because it was all through connections, right? And and that's where where that was built. Um, so, I think founders need to understand that they have limitations in what they bring to the table with investors, and they really need to be honest about that with themselves and to the investors. If, for example, uh, we're working uh, on a project right now um, that uh, is intended to help us with the next pandemic, essentially. And uh, I have often said to people we've been having discussions with investments for, this is a project that is built to be acquired. But if you expect us to go IPO, I'm not that person and I will happily step aside because it's a, it's a totally different skill set. It's just not, it's not the same right. uh, as, as being a founder. It's important to understand your limitations. Yeah, and I, I mean, I sort of, um, I, I know I've had a fair amount of conversations about this as well, um, that, uh, you know, companies that, that are going to IPO, um, you have to also consider the future then of the company and, mm -hmm. and sort of the attractiveness, I would say, of the broader investment market to invest in your, in your company. Um, and there are a lot of, I mean, I, I, I said in Colorado, right. And, and there are a lot of companies here that I think IPO would with the idea that, Hey, look, we're going to, you know, we're essentially going to have the next, you know, big unicorn, uh, round of investment come and they quickly find out that there's a bubble and then that yeah. bubble sort of retracts and then they're, they become almost like a penny stock. Yep. And so it's, it's a, uh, a very tough, sort of situation. And, and it's one of the things that I know I've, I've also had the same discussion with companies that, you know, look, if you IPO, I essentially, you know, would like to exit at that point. So similar sort of situation that uh, yeah. I just don't want to be there because it, it sort of leads to all sorts of reporting and other things that, you know, essentially, you know, aren't, aren't about getting the end science to, to market anymore either. Yes. It's, it's That's not to say it can't be done. But, but the circumstances have to be right. I mean, you have an MBA, I have an MBA. There's no way in heck I would take a company IPO. I just, right. unless I had a whole cadre of, you know, the experts on how to do this and lawyers, and maybe that's what it takes. But but I don't think that provides the, the shareholders the best value, ultimately. Right. Um, so Vishnu, thank you for your question. I appreciate that. John, I'm going to take you to the last three questions here. It sure. looks like your image is frozen on my side. So for anybody that's oh. watching and John looks like he's frozen, it's, it's okay. We, we still got you. Um, and, and I'll continue on. So um, John, the last three questions start with what inspires you? Uh, I like helping people. And uh, my mother was a pediatric AIDS nurse. Uh, and I've seen the importance of diagnostics uh, in, in um, you know, the infectious disease space. Uh, so I'm very interested in, in helping people, always been driven uh, that way. So that's my, that's my ultimate driver. Uh, very, uh, I, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, it is an um, interesting sort of um, question to ask, you know, people what might, what might possibly bring them to the, to this point as well. And we have you fully back. Uh, you're back. I, I switched cameras. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I have, I, I have one camera, though it's the one that we're on that when in between times, it seems to either freeze or go to sleep. And so a uh, similar sort of situation where I'm having to, to, to make sure that this camera is going to work through the, the broadcast as well. Second question, what concerns you? Uh, this is actually really personal to me as a virologist, uh, having lived through a pandemic I never thought I would see, quite honestly, uh, in my life, although I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. What really concerns me is that um, I've been a part of the discussions uh, in the diagnostic space post 9-11 all of those years ago about biological surveillance, yes, especially microbiological surveillance, and nothing really has changed, even having gone through a pandemic. And I've seen some tremendous efforts uh, to try to have better reporting, better testing, whatever the issues are. 
uh, and we just can't seem to get past the X factor. I don't really know what that is. Um, there, it's multifactorial. Uh, so that that really concerns me because, again, as a virologist, I know that there that this was uh, maybe, maybe you know, saying this out of turn, but I think this pandemic was a baby pandemic. <clears throat> I think it, it can get much worse, and I think we may be faced with a situation where it will be much worse. Well, we're not actively building out uh, what we need to do to help combat that. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night. And that's quite honestly what we're working on at the moment. Very good. Yeah, it's interesting to think about because there are so many people I feel like that have warned, that even warned of COVID before COVID happened. You know, look, this this idea that, you know, these pandemics, you know, happen only in third world countries, you know, isn't necessarily reality. And, um, you know, it could touch all of us at, some, you know, at yeah. some point in time. And all of a sudden that day was here. And I remember, I remember also being a skeptic as well. I remember mm -hmm. when, you know, COVID was happening and, and they were talking about, look, we're, we are going to essentially stop having people go into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember telling my wife, I was like, I, I can't imagine that that's going to happen. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you know, we essentially to go to work, if you didn't have, you know, essentially a letter that, that deemed that, you know, it was vi vital that you go to work, uh, right. you weren't to go to the office. And I was right. like, isn't that yeah. a surprise? Well, actually, <laughs> you and I had very, very different uh, reactions to this uh, because <laughs> right. it was in late December uh, 2019 that I remember telling my family, this is going to get really weird and potentially really ugly. Um, and this, you know, you can't shut down a city of many million people if something significant is not happening. So again, I think um, it, it took all of us by surprise and it's easy to forget. Uh, we, we as a country are pretty isolated, uh, at least in our minds. Uh, but I'd like to remind you and whoever's watching that in, I think it was uh, July 6th of this month, we had the most number of planes ever in the air uh, in, in that day. It was 174,000 flights or something ridiculous. And the percentage of people who were masked on those planes was you know, probably less than 0.01%, meaning we are all continuing to be perfect vectors for whatever is next. And if you're watching the uh, reading the publications on H1N1 and other things emerging, you know, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favors right now. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Last question. What excites you? You know, I'm excited for the younger generation of scientists. Honestly, uh, it makes me a little, uh, I don't, I don't know if for is the right word, but, but a little jealous perhaps. Um, I have a son who's doing uh, research in uh, astro astrophysics and he and his generation of scientists are really deploying these amazing modern tools related to big data and big data analysis, uh, the amazing work that was done on the viral genome sequences. And uh, it just blows my mind uh, what, what they're working on. And, and I'm, I'm pretty envious, but I'm really excited to see the stuff that's coming out. Yeah, I remember I, this is, uh, uh, well, it's, it takes me back a little ways. I think it's probably like six or so years. I was working with a, a company called API out of Issaquah, Washington, and they were um, working on a super resolution mic microscopy project. So they essentially you know, brought this technology to, to market and were selling it, you know, to researchers in terms of, you know, being able to look inside the structures of cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the scientists that explained to me is like, you know, look, imagine that that you sort of get a picture with a lot of things that you can't see because they're around a corner and things like that. Essentially, what we're doing with math is figuring out not just the structures that you can see, but also the mm -hmm. ones that are around the corner and below your mm -hmm. feet and other things. And he was just, you know, really energetic about this. And so, um, yeah, if, uh, if anybody's listening from, from API and you talk to Steve Reese still, um, you know, he, the, his words still resonate with me because it's amazing what, you know, good scientists can do. And I can only imagine, you know, on space exploration, the same sort of thing, right? It just amazing. It's going to be crazy. The, yeah. and, and biology in space is, oh man, I was, I was born too, too long ago. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you sharing me, sharing with me everything about Folio and, uh, and for especially staying up so late in Hawaii uh, to be with me. So thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate it. Thank you.